Hi, I'm Richard Klass, your lecturer on strategic planning. Welcome to this audiovisual presentation that will cover key concepts that will help you understand business decisions impacting asset allocation, product mix determinations, sales and marketing initiatives, and legal and political maneuvers. The insights from this lecture focus on product and service life cycle eventualities that should underpin decisions for funding or defunding or level of marketing support for specific products or services. You will come to understand organizations typically cannot invest in all high cost technologies. They must pick their spots depending upon need and return on investment opportunities. I'll discuss the benefits of achieving first mover advantage versus the risks and rewards of coming to market after a market initiator. Lastly, you will gain insights into the importance of scalability of a product or service. Many of these insights help focus on asset allocation decisions and maneuvers that protect enterprises from the efforts of rivals that want more market share. The life cycle concept is easy to understand. Virtually every industry and every product or service is born and eventually dies. Every life cycle stage sees new or existing rivals, changes in pricing strategies among competitors, and shifts in profitability. Organizations should use analysis of life cycle position to ultimately make decisions on industries to enter or exit and products or services that warrant more or less resources. The life cycle curve has four cycles. First, there is an introduction phase where there is little to no competition. Unit prices are high. Profitability is typically excellent. The second phase is a period of sales growth. Prices are still high and profitability is good, but good profitability starts to attract rivals. Maturity is a phase where competition is stiff. Market share is splintered. Rivals start offering reduced price options to capture share. As a result, margins start declining. The last phase is highlighted by declining sales volume. Prices and profits have eroded substantially. Some players decide to leave the fray. The Boston Consulting Group is very well known. They use a quadrant analysis as a similar analytical tool to the life cycle curve. Their question mark quadrant is for new market entrants, products or services, where market success is not definitively known. The stars quadrant is for products or services that are driving growing revenues and profitability. The cash cow segment is for offerings that are generating consistent cash flows and profitability. The dog segment is offerings where unit sales and profitability are declining. An interesting way to view the two concepts is to overlay the four attributes. You can see how the Boston Consulting Group matrix designations align with the life cycle stages. Companies are always looking for ways to change the slope of the life cycle curve. This is often accomplished by improving technology or adding product features and benefits to existing products. One good example is the mobile phone. Without changing the product from a basic communication device to a multi-purpose handheld computer, the cell phone would be at the tail end of the life cycle curve. Without much product differentiation, the prices of a basic phone would be cheap. TV sets are another example. The move from analog to digital revived the life cycle of this consumer good. Everyone now wants a great big screen with ever increasing clarity. A company's portfolio or the mix of its products and or service offerings is a very important attribute contributing to success. Obviously, core offerings that are highly desired by consumers that can currently have great profit margins are ideal. But another factor is the projected sales trajectory of each offering. You want to invest in growing opportunities and diminish resource allocations 
towards products or services entering the declining phase of their life cycle. It is a frequent strategy for companies to sell off whole divisions, even though they are profitable. These divisions just don't meet their growth needs to meet investor expectations or return on capital requirements. All enterprises, regardless of size, should be highly focused on looking for long-term profitability and adjust their asset allocations accordingly. There are five positions to a technology curve that describe related investment timing. These phases are innovator, where an investment could be very risky, early adopter, early majority, late majority, or laggard. Without a doubt, rivals could view tech adoption differently in an effort to gain a leg up on rivals. In some circumstances, technology implementation is a strategic decision, meaning that technology that can give an enterprise a cost of production advantage or a sustainable competitive advantage in another way over a competitor is strategic by definition. It's usually too expensive to invest in every new technology, so you have to pick your spots. Consider a hospital that wants to be an innovator regarding MRI technology and always upgrades to the highest possible Tesla, but wants to wait on adopting robotic technology and definitely wants to delay for a long time acquiring a proton beam accelerator for cancer treatment. The investors on the show Shark Tank often mention the importance of scalability. This concept refers to the ease and ability of rapidly bringing an offering to many customers. For example, it's easier to sell books to a national audience online than depending upon brick and mortar stores. Consider behavioral health services. Which is the winning strategy in the long run? Building expensive office space to render therapy or offering the same service online. Even group therapy can now easily be offered through an online meeting platform. Attaining first mover advantage drives many organizations to innovate. First mover advantage means capturing an entirely new market or a defined market segment. The capturing of an entirely new market is an important part of the definition. First to market companies are not necessarily those with the first iteration of a product. For example, the Kenback One is considered the first personal computer. Not many people have heard of it. The Kenback was launched in 1971. The Radio Shack TRS-80 was launched in 1977, but it was considered a hobby machine and not a serious business computer. The key point is to be considered a first market mover you have to make a big splash with customers. An example of a first market mover is the Da Vinci surgical system. Launched in 2000, the company remains the market leader in robotic surgery. However, like all profitable market segments, competition is heating up. The value of a company's first to market status and speed to market capabilities is only as good as the entity's ability to keep competition from catching up quickly with equivalent or better products. Therefore, building barriers to competitor market entry is an essential strategic consideration to keep the riches achieved by maintaining a superior market position. Being a second mover or even a late mover to market may have benefits. Most notably, there is reduced risk because market parameters are better known. For example, customer needs and product features and benefits most valued by likely purchasers become more apparent. Second movers may learn from the first movers mistakes. Beyond product design, methods of better target marketing and customer acquisition may be more obvious. The first mover may have to spend a lot of money on customer education that a second mover can avoid. Regardless if you are a first to market player, or a late stage market entrant, you want to prevent market share erosion. Protecting profitable business lines from rivals is a never ending thought process and requires continuous decision making and implementation of important tactics. 
Strategists and senior leadership focus on constructing meaningful barriers by such activities as achieving unduplicated economies of scale. This prevents rivals from implementing profitable pricing strategies. That is, if they cannot produce a similar product cheaper, they are not likely to gain market share by offering a cheaper product. Negotiating long-term contracts that keep new market entrants from gaining a foothold with customers is a strong hurdle for rivals. Entering into an exclusive distributor relationship or consulting arrangement are good illustrations of this point. Participating in markets requiring intensive capital outlays certainly prevents companies with weak financials to establish a competing enterprise. While often a weak barrier, protecting valuable patents may bring a lawsuit when necessary, gives encroachers pause in bringing copycat products to market. Lobbying for regulations to keep rivals out of a specific territory is a difficult to achieve barrier, but a very powerful option. An example is a zoning restriction that limits hospital construction to one location in, in a municipality. Keeping available resources away from rivals is a barrier that can take many forms. For example, hiring all of the best doctors in a specific region is a significant issue for competitors. Another illustration is China's cornering of the rare earth metals market that gives this country a powerful chip in the development of most electronic devices. Creating high switching costs make it difficult for customers to change suppliers. For example, companies keep customers by establishing high setup fees or significant penalties for early contract termination. Consumers find it difficult to change suppliers when capital equipment expenditures require many years of operation to recapture investment value. Switching costs protect market share when competitors establish less expensive or better service. Switching costs are usually one-time events and they are not necessarily financial in nature. The development of hard to duplicate technology puts up a huge barrier to entry. Consider a technology such as robotic surgery equipment the computer science investment, pathway to regulatory approval, physician training requirements, all limit this market to only a few competitors. Segmentation is a widely used marketing term. Many strategic theorists promote segmentation as an important concept. For example, Michael Porter indicates smaller companies best compete by focusing on smaller market niches when they can offer specific products to better meet customer needs. I want you to understand there are two types of segmentation. One form of segmentation looks at priori data already available from internal information systems. For example, sales by customer segment. Behavioral segmentation is much more powerful, but this information has to come from primary market research efforts that can be very expensive. The term positioning is one you may hear a lot. It's often mentioned in the same breadth as segmentation. You will be ahead of most people if you really understand the concept. Positioning is what you do to form customer impressions. One method of identifying a product or company's market position is through brand mapping. One means to do this is through correspondence analysis. This analytical tool is available in many different statistical software packages. The correspondence map shows the attributes most associated with the brand. For example, Bear Health is most associated with the attributes, serves the entire community, easy to access services, and care for children. A powerful addition to a brand map is a representation of the size of the market an attribute represents. In this example, suppose Bear Health has just as good a cardiac program as religious health systems. Bear Health could mount a marketing campaign to change patients' perceptions and move their position to the largest market segment, which is represented by segment C, heart programs. The last concept I want to introduce you to may be the most difficult to understand. It relates to forward pricing a product. It is the brainchild of the Boston Consulting Group. 
To demonstrate this concept, this is a traditional break-even chart. You have a fixed cost line that represents such expenses as rent and insurance that do not change over time. Then you have a total cost line that represents variable costs of an item. Every time an item is sold, an enterprise incurs the variable cost for such items as materials and direct supply expense. Then you have a revenue line that starts at the apex of the X and Y axis. Every time you sell a product, then you would record a revenue. Obviously, if you have no sales, then you have no revenues. Then you have the break-even point, which is right here. And again, just as another orientation, this entire section here would be losses, and this entire section over here would be profits. In forward pricing, the seller offers the product at a very low price, often less than the variable cost. This means, of course, there will be a loss in the near term. The idea is to rapidly expand the market and learn enough about production costs and bulk purchasing discounts and materials to drive down costs quickly. The end result is competitors don't want to enter the market because it's not profitable, and you have eventually a very big market to sell products. Consider the cost of calculators. Simple calculators with add, subtract, multiply, and divide functions were hundreds of dollars when they first came out. Now you can buy advanced full function calculators for just a few dollars. This last chart combines both the traditional break-even chart with the forward pricing break-even chart. You can see the idea that you may incur bigger losses in the near term, but the revenue line may be higher and the total cost line lower. This leads to more profits. I appreciate the time you took to view this video. Hope you learned some things that will advance your thinking as you tackle strategic problems and initiatives. There are many different ways to advance your knowledge of strategic planning. I hope you will continue to review my videos on the topic. I also highly recommend you go to the McKinsey & Company website and sign up for their newsletter covering strategic planning.